welcome to everyone. It's really nice to see you this evening. So this is the second webinar that we're doing from Quorum Chambers to help people who are engaged in the interview process and hopefully to better the outcomes that you um, may receive from this year's process or next year's as well. So this is the second part. And um, the first part took place on the 27th of January and involved the sorts of written answers that you need to provide to get an interview. This, this session is really to do with the interviews themselves in the hope that we're going to give you some advice which will help you to secure pupillage offers, which is ultimately the aim of the game for everybody involved. So this is a recorded session and it's going to go onto Quorum's YouTube channel, um, hopefully for you to be able to watch at your own leisure. Um, in addition to that, one of the things I would recommend that you watch is a day in the life of video that I think was recorded at the end of last year, and you hopefully will find that helpful as well. Nevertheless, um, what we are aiming to do in this session is give you some sense of the interview process, how we structure it, how it works on the day and what we're looking for, and also the types of questions we ask. In addition to that, um, we're going to go through two question and answer sessions, um, which are pre-recorded. And I'm really hoping, and all of us here to this, uh, this evening, are hoping that you will get a really clear sense of what distinguishes a good answer from a really superb answer, and the sort of answer that you need to be give it, giving in order to get those um, pupillage offers. And after that, um, what we're going to do is give you some advice about how to prep for the interview process itself. So before I go any further, um, I'm just going to introduce all of us this evening. I'm an Arkley Musgrave, I probably should have done this sooner. Um, I and Alex Lang, we're head of pupillage in Coram. Um, Sam Watson, Srishti Suresh are um, not our very most junior tenants, but they're just one year up from being. And we're thrilled, we're thrilled to have them here because of course, it's not been very long since they've been um, involved in the pupillage process themselves. And in addition to that, we have Daniel Taylor, who is actually an actual pupil. So he is the most recent um, person. And I actually remember interviewing Daniel as well. Um, Ginny Wilson, you will all be familiar with because she's been helping us manage all of these sessions so far. So I don't really need to say anything further now. I'm going to hand over to Alex and he's going to explain to you a little bit more about, like I say, the interview process and, and what to expect. Thank you, Anarkali. Um, hi, everyone. And as Anarkali says, thanks for coming and hello to all the future people uh, watching this on YouTube when it inevitably goes viral and we find our fame and fortune. Uh, the good news is that you've got through webinar one, which is the written applications, and you've made it to interview. Um, so congratulations to all of you for getting through to this stage. What I'm going to do is just spend a couple of minutes setting out how our interview process works, uh, what it looks like and what we're looking for. So we have a two stage interview process, a shorter one, and then if you get through a longer one. Normally for the first round of um, interviews, we invite about 14 of uh, the many paper applications that we're pleased to receive. So about 14 people get through to that first round. We're going this year, we think, to conduct it by video. The interviews tend to last about 15 minutes and they take the following format. Um, there'll be a panel of three or four of us uh, waiting to greet you. Uh, and before you arrive in the virtual interview room, each member of the panel will have gone through your application form. And you'll remember from the first webinar that that will already have been double or triple blind marked by various members of chambers. But additionally, each member of the panel will go through that and will award the application form a mark out of five. Uh, then to start the interview, we're very conscious that it can be a pretty nerve wracking thing. Uh, and actually, of course, what we want from this process is to get the best people. And as part of that, we want to get um, uh, people who are able to feel comfortable um, and people to give their best answers uh, under the pressure of, of the interview. Um, but just to help with that process, we start off with an unassessed question that we call the icebreaker. And that is the one and only question that will be on your 
application form it's, and really it's just to, to get you chatting get you warmed up uh, and hopefully settle the nerves a little bit then in this first round interview you will be asked three assessed questions each one by a different member of the interview panel uh, last year in the first round there was one question that was uh, a legal issue that required some legal analysis a question on diversity and then a question on ethics uh, and i'll just say at this point we're going to think about ethics a bit more detail in a bit more detail in, in one of our practice questions um but we're very conscious that if you haven't yet started or indeed completed the bptc then your understanding of your familiarization with ethics may be uh, less than those who've already completed that stage uh, and we take that into account in the marking um, there's nothing to do in terms of paperwork for the interview itself for this first round uh, and you'll end up with a mark out of 20 so five for the written application and five for each of those three assessed questions uh, then of those 14 or so people who got through to the first round uh, we'll invite somewhere between six and eight people most likely through to the second round interview which will take place a couple of weeks later uh, that is likely to be in person uh, and will be double the length lasting approximately 30 minutes uh, there you're likely to be greeted by a panel of five of us so uh, a larger panel to make sure that we have a cross-section or a greater cross-section of members of chambers uh, and in the same way as with the first round each member of that panel will before you come into the interview room look at uh, your application form and give to it a mark out of five you will then once again be asked an unassessed icebreaker so something different about your application form uh, and again just to settle the nerves and get used to the process uh, after which the interview proper will start and you'll be asked four uh, formal assessed questions almost certainly with some follow-up questions uh, in respect of those initial questions as we go along each one of those again will be asked by a different panel member uh, and for the second round interviews last year those questions were on um, diversity uh, a general question about the profession and skills that uh, one would expect a good barrister to have and then there were two questions that um, uh, in contrast to the first round interview require some preparatory work so to do that we'll ask you we'll have asked you to arrive something like 30 minutes before the interview starts uh, and we'll have given you some bits of paper with some information on that we'll ask you to digest and think about uh, and there will then be two questions on the contents of those bits of paper one is likely to be the presentation of a legal argument and the second is likely to be an analysis of a case uh, excerpt that we provide you with um, so you will end up there with a mark out of 25 so five for each of the four assessed questions five for the written application uh, and then the top couple of candidates we will offer pupillage to in accordance with the gateway timetable so hopefully that removes a bit of mystery in terms of how the process works just briefly to touch on what we're um, looking for really in assessing your answers during interview we're looking for two separate things the first is presentation um, so we expect our candidates to be um, well turned out to give considered articulate answers to be well structured uh, to try not to let nerves take over and talk too quickly the second thing then we think about is content uh, and there really we're looking for nuance subtlety and an ability to consider sometimes difficult uh, concepts we, of, often there'll be tensions in the questions that we ask uh, and we want you to draw out those tensions and present arguments or present uh, considered views on them so that's the sort of thing we're looking for um to show you uh, how it is and isn't done now we're going to look at a couple of uh, example questions so i think over to Ginny who hopefully is going to play the first of those for us. Thank you. Hi, Srishti. Uh, welcome to uh, Quorum and our pupillage interview process today. Thank you very much for coming in. 
Uh, we wanted in particular to ask you the following question. I, I can see that you've pen and paper in front of you. Do please feel free to use them. Do please feel free to pause before answering. So I'm going to read out a proposition. Uh, you can pick whether you wish to argue in favour of or against it. Uh, and as I say, feel free to write it down and feel free to pause before answering. The proposition is this. In desperate times, basic values remain. If the criminal justice system cannot ensure that a defendant is tried within a reasonable period, then even an alleged serial killer must not be held in prison pre-trial. So that's the proposition. Um, start off, please, by telling us if you're going to argue in favour of or against the proposition and then present your argument. Um, thank you. Um, I am going to argue in favour of it. Um, I, I don't think an alleged perpetrator should be held in prison for longer than a reasonable period pre-trial. Um, I, I think that I think that to do so would risk unfairness to an alleged perpetrator that would essentially, in my opinion, be unjustifiable. I do obviously recognise there is a public safety consideration, but I don't think that that overrides that unfairness. I would say the main reason is this. When you think of a serial killer who is obviously the most extreme example, um, but, but that point remains because that's what's in the proposition, you're thinking of someone who is effectively a huge threat to the public and holding them in prison for however long a period until their trial even would, would obviously stop that. So what the proposition is providing is a solution to that public safety element. Um, that is, of course, assuming that person is going to be found guilty of... What's, this, what's the solution? Well, the solution is, of course, that they're not free to go out and and do it to someone else um, if in fact they are going to be found guilty of committing that offence but that that's the problem that I identify with this if they're not guilty on the other hand then what you risk is holding them for a large a significant period of time and then once the trial process is over they've served a sentence for a crime they didn't commit without it, ever having had the chance to answer to it. It, it sounds like you're elevating an abstract principle of fairness over the protection of the lives of your fellow citizens uh, and what more fundamental role does the state play than protecting those citizens i th i think that protecting citizens includes people that are being accused of a crime um, in one way or another, aren't we all trying to abide by the law? Um, but also, aren't we all relying on the law to treat us fairly? Okay. That would include somebody that is awaiting trial, in my view, which is why I say, until we know that they've definitely done something wrong, shouldn't we be giving them a reasonable chance to not effectively be being treated as if they've committed the offence already. And, it, and if you're just going to let all of these people out, what's the cutoff point? Let's say that the trial is due to commence, um, but in the present context, the judge is taken ill with COVID. And because the court lists are busy, that means there's a delay of four months after when the trial was originally meant to be. You, you just let them out, will you, because of that, because of, in effect, a quirk of fate? Well, I... But what if we held them for four months in the alternative, if the opposite of this was what was happening? Um, what if we held them for four months and then actually at the end of the trial, it's not found beyond reasonable doubt that they did what they're being accused of. Um, okay. I and, would think the other the other eventuality is worse. And, and just pausing there, if you were to flip the proposition around and argue against it, can you identify what your 
primary or strongest argument would then be? Um, I think I probably sound like I'm repeating what you're saying, but it would it would be that they're not being monitored in the kind of setting that being in in prison would provide. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, Srishti, for your your time and your um, care in uh, arguing that proposition. Um, and you'll hear from us soon. Great. So that was an answer which was not a total disaster, but at the same time, there was there were plainly areas for improvement there, as I'm sure you will all have noticed. Um, I, I'm going to start by kind of leading the critique and identifying to all of you some of the areas that we commonly find in people who could improve their answers, but don't quite do that. And um, Swishi's answer was a great example of a lot of themes that we often encounter and which can be avoided. Um, the first impression I think Swishi gave was that she had not really spent much time thinking about what she was going to say. And her answer, I dare say, would have been much improved if she'd actually spent some time thinking about it. Um, and you will see as she was put under pressure from Alex, a lot of her thinking began to unravel. Now, I think a better approach from her point of view would have been to think about the answer and think about the nuances of this answer. So it's kind of an artificial proposition in the sense that it really seeks to make um, black and white an answer, which is actually, uh, you know, a situation which is very nuanced. Um, and I think, first of all, what Srishti did was she started out in her answer by being really quite vague she starts talking about unfairness in a kind of slightly meaningless way. I think we know what she's trying to say, but she's she's doing it in such a way of a vague way that it's not actually arguing a case. It's just kind of presenting it in a slightly incoherent manner. And what she fails to identify in a question like this that is that actually a better better quality answer will identify that there's really a balance to be struck here and what Swishti is doing is uh, she's um, falling into the trap as it were really of, of tr trying to suggest that it's all one way or all another but in doing so she fails to recognize the nuance that a better answer would have encapsulated. And what I mean by this is she was saying, you know, um, she she seemed to, she seemed not to recognize that, for example, um, being remanded in custody serves more than one purpose. It's not just about risk to citizens. It's also about the fact that people abscond. It's um, about the fact that um, being remanded in custody is typically an exercise that ca is carried out according to previous convictions. And it's actually quite a nuanced exercise, well, typically in the Crown Court, it's supposed to be. And her argument doesn't really recognise any of that, any of the practicalities of being remanded in custody. Um, and actually being remanded in custody is an exercise which, as I say, has reference to all of those parts. And Swishi's answer didn't, didn't notice that. And in some way, she really kind of strayed over to being in my opinion, quite naive about some of the people that she was talking about. So, for example, when she said, um, in one way or another, aren't we all trying to abide by the law? I really, I really strongly don't agree with that, actually. <laughs> and that's not, that's not my experience. Um, and uh, I think to, to say that in such a kind of overstated way undermines the credibility of her arguments overall, because it suggests that she's not being realistic and she hasn't really thought this through. Um, and I think when she would, you know, Alex suggested to her that the state has a duty to protect its citizens. So she kind of took an answer, which actually is potentially quite interesting, which is that, you know, part of that duty is actually to make sure that we have a system that is nuanced for in each individual. But she kind of, instead of developing that in an interesting way, 
she kind of said, well, you know, part of protecting the citizens includes making sure that people aren't remanded in custody, you know, forever and ever. Uh, and that that's not an un, that's like I say, that's not a bad argument. But what she didn't do was develop it in in the way that I would have expected um, a, a more kind of sophisticated argument to run with that. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that I was struck by, particularly towards the end, was that she, as proof that she hadn't really thought this through, when Alex said to her, what's, what's the strongest argument against your argument? She was struggling a bit to identify that, which suggests to me that this was, like I say, a bit inchoate, because the strongest argument, of course, would be risk or people absconding and not, not coming to trial. You know, that, that, those are the strongest risks and that, that's the strongest argument against what she's arguing. So, you know, there were times where, I think when she was answering as well, it really didn't seem like she was even very persuaded by her own argument. She was a bit hesitant and she was a bit disfluent. Now, those are quite a lot of criticisms and it may seem like I'm being extremely critical of somebody who was put, put on the spot. But the reason I'm trying to be critical like this is because I'm trying to give you all a really good example of how there are all the multiplicity of ways that you can take this answer and improve it yourself. So we're trying to kind of identify the maximum learning points. I mean, in practice, an answer like Swishti's would We'd, give, we'd certainly give her some marks. It wasn't a, a bad answer. She certainly wasn't totally wrong. Um, but it probably, if she answered all of her questions like that, it's highly unlikely that we would be giving her a pupillage offer for those reasons. Alex, did you have anything you wanted to add? I think that's very helpful and um, very comprehensive. I think I think I learned a lot from that too. So thank you, Anakali. Um, I, I'm not sure I'll be that good under pressure. So I think what we're going to do now is Srishti having taken on that feedback um, is going to give us a, a stronger answer if she's happy to do so. So we're back in interview mode, Srishti. Um, here we are, final round, final question. It's all down to this. Um, what's the answer? So I'm going to argue in favour of this proposition. Um, I don't think an alleged defendant should be held in prison for longer than a reasonable period pre-trial. But I think in answering this question, I really have to acknowledge and identify that there's a clash point between the principle and the practice that's inherent in that proposition. I think the principle is that it undermines the idea uh, that someone is innocent until they're proven guilty. We do, of course, have the power to hold people in custody pre-trial, but only for a short and limited period of time, in my view, because of uh, the risk that to extend that beyond a reasonable parameter would effectively risk putting the sentence before the trial one could wonder what the utility and purpose of the criminal justice system is if we seek to go out with that. And then the practical point that I identified is really that it boils down to a risk assessment, in my view, between the perception of public safety and fair treatment by the criminal justice system. Um, those two things, we wouldn't like to think they'd be forced into conflict with each other, but sometimes they are. Um, it is my view, though, that there are other ways to mitigate that public safety risk, ones that we presently use and rely on. For example, we really only have the power to hold someone in custody normally for 24 hours, up to 96 if uh, it's an offence that qualifies, or up to two weeks if it's a terrorism-related offence. Um, for the intervening period, and we know there are delays in the criminal justice system, we, we remand in custody, we use other things that are case-specific to look at the profile of the alleged offender and what we can do to, to safeguard effectively, um, to prevent them from fleeing, to have a, a form of monitoring, to have them reporting. That allows us to be, I think, comprehensive and specific in our approach without shortchanging, in effect, the people that are awaiting the outcome of a potential criminal trial. Wonderful, five out of five from, from me. Thank, thank you, Srishti. J just a couple of things that I would particularly emphasize about that um, beautiful answer. It very fluent, um, very sophisticated in terms of the content, obviously extremely articulate, um, had the killer line put in the sentence before the trial. Um, where I sitting on the interview panel, I'd have noted that down really like that and given it a big tick. And actually I think one, one of the best things about that answer, and this is a general point that applies to the presentation of arguments across the board, it seemed so obviously reasonable 
And when something seems so obviously reasonable, it's very, very compelling. And in fact, that's I think that's a real skill for barristers to develop. And if somebody is already able to do that um, under the pressure of the pupilage interview, then then frankly, they're doing really, really, really well. Uh, I would just like to add to that. What was lovely about Swishley's answer was that it was actually very interesting. And I think that's a really important thing for you to remember that, you know, when you hear her answer, you actually want to keep on listening to it because the way she develops her arguments is kind of lovely to, to kind of hear unfold. And so the interest factor is a really significant one. Um, the way that she presented it was so was so beautiful as well. So thank you so much for doing that, Swishti. And with, on that note, what we're going to do is a second example. And this is, again, pre-recorded. And um, I think uh, Ginny is going to help put that on the screen now for us. Thanks, Ginny. Hi, Daniel. Uh, thank you very much for coming to interview today. One of the questions that we wanted to ask you was this. Uh, I'm going to give you a scenario and I, I can see very sensibly you've got a pen and paper, so you may wish to write the scenario down. Do please feel free to pause for a moment and gather your thoughts before answering. So the scenario is this. You are at court representing a client in children law proceedings. He, the client, is accused of abusing his child, Jocelyn. Your client tells you that it's not true. But he also reveals that, unbeknownst to the judge, he did a long time ago abuse Jocelyn's adult sister, Abigail. You consider that this information could have an impact on the case. Your instructing solicitor, who's also at court with you, disagrees and sees it as irrelevant because the case is not about Abigail and it was a long time ago. Uh, she, your instructing solicitor, suggests you just ignore it. Your client confirms that he does not want this information revealed and instructs you not to say anything about it. So that's the scenario, Daniel. W what do you think you might do in response to that? The first thing to think about, I would say, is that the first core duty will likely be engaged. That duty is the duty that one has as a barrister towards the court. Um, I would say, I would think that this would be engaged because the information you said in, in your view would be relevant. And because it's relevant, I think that would in itself invoke a duty towards the court and that you cannot mislead the court. You said, I think, that the solicitor uh, takes the view that the information isn't relevant. Yeah. Uh, so how do you balance that? I would say that while that is important, it can't, you can't allow the solicitor's views to override your ultimate responsibility um, over whether the information should be disclosed. And I would say that regardless of the solicitor's input and the solicitor's opinion, you must take your own personal view as to whether the information needs to be disclosed. But, but what if you think that solicitor might feed back to the clerks that you haven't done a good job because you're not listening to her? It's, reputation's really important, isn't it? Of course your reputation is important, but your principal duty is to your client and to the court. Okay. And in those circumstances, your opinion as to, as to how all the solicitor considers yourself and as to whether they would give you work in the future would have to take a second seat. Okay. Or a step back. Sure. Yeah. And th then what are you doing about the, the client? If you do come to the come to the view that the information should be disclosed, that core duty to disclose um, or not to mislead the court comes up against the duty of confidentiality that you owe towards your client. And it's okay. The circumstance that should you come to that view that it should be disclosed, who really do oppose each other. If ultimately you do come to the view that this is information that must be before the court, I think that is information that you should sell, tell to your client and you should advise to your client that that is the view that you take. 
ultimately, if you're unable to get your client's consent to the disclosing of that information and you consider it in the best interest of the court to disclose the information, then I do not see how you could continue to act for that client while maintaining the duties of both confidentiality and um, the duties to the administration of justice. Okay, you said if you consider it in the best interest of the court, who are you to decide what the best interests of the court are? I would consider that to be part of the responsibility of every barrister. Okay. Um, so you've given that advice to your client. And let's say I'm your client. I say, no way are you telling anyone that. I'm paying you. Brief. Mm -hmm. Get on with it. If I am still of the review, if I remain of the view that it's information that must be before the court and my client does not permit me to put it in front of the court, and that does place me in the position where I have to tell my client and then eventually the court that I could no longer continue to act. Okay, so you're going to go into the judge, are you, and, and tell the judge this information and that, that you can't act? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, and is there anyone else you'd report the information to? I think there would be a duty to 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 consider whether it would need to be reported more broadly. <laughs> Difficult to say who would be the most appropriate body to talk um, to disclose the information to, but perhaps the bar standards boards may okay. be ready to contact. Um, All right, more, more fully. Um, okay, Daniel. Well, well, thank you very much, and it was. Uh, a pleasure to meet you today. Thank you for coming in to interview. Thank you. So with Thrishti, what we saw is a, an averagey answer and then an excellent answer. I would suggest that, that Daniel falls there in his recorded answer somewhere between um, those two. So in terms of good things, things that would be scoring him points from the marker sitting there, he obviously nails the central core duty to the court. Um, he picks up very well on the point that you should, of course, listen to and respect the views of your professional client, the solicitor, but that when it comes down to it, this is a judgment for you to make in line with your ethical duties. Uh, and whilst listening to and respecting that view, it's not determinative and you mustn't be swayed by it. And, and he dealt very well with that even when pushed. So there's stuff about, well, what if the solicitor calls up the clerks and says, you're doing an awful job and they're never going to instruct you again. He, he wasn't worried about that. So that's absolutely right. Um, he, uh, again, nailed the, the relevant duty to the client, which is the importance of keeping that information confidential. And then the tension between that and the aforementioned duty to the court. Um, and he reached the conclusion, the accurate conclusion, that he was likely to be professionally embarrassed uh, and that therefore he wouldn't be able further to participate in the case. Um, obviously, you may have spotted that he made a couple of errors. Um, two big ones leapt out at me. The first is that, having said he had a duty of confidentiality, he, he fell into the trap of when I said to him, well, you're going to go into the courtroom and tell the judge the information. He, he nodded along, um, which obviously <laughs> isn't good and would breach his duty of confidentiality to his client and would get him, I think, in big trouble. Uh, and then the second obvious error um, was, uh, you need to think about in these situations actually whether you have a broader duty um, to report what would otherwise be confidential information to a protective um, service of the state outside of the family proceedings. And the two obvious candidates there would be the police or children's services. Uh, I don't think the Bar Sanders Board uh, are going to be much help if he says that his client um, has potentially or has abused someone in the past. So those were errors. Um, things that would make the answer even better, and, and to me he seemed uh, pretty fluent and articulate, but things to make it even better are just a practical focus and a recognition that you don't need to charge into doing all of this, that, that these things are difficult, they're often finely balanced and that there's support out there and, and you should use it. So particularly as a junior barrister in your second six in pupillage, and we would be looking for this um, in an answer. You can call and should call, I think, the Bar Ethics Hotline. That's always available and get some advice. 
um, you can contact your colleagues, junior members of chambers, senior members of chambers, your heads of chambers. Uh, and not only is that a good idea to do, just because it helps you find the right solution, but also it insulates you to a certain degree in the event of any trouble down the line, because you have sought advice from other sources. Uh, and then just thinking really practically, putting yourself in that room and thinking about the, the different emotions and the competing pressures. So you've got your client saying, I'm paying you, get on with it. Your solicitor saying, this is ridiculous, get on with it. Uh, and just practically how you'd manage them what you'd say to each of them, who would you speak to first? I mean, just thinking out loud, my thought, I think, would be that I'd try to have a quiet word with the solicitor, uh, try to get her on, and Anarkley's nodding, which I find reassuring. So try, try, to, get, try to get her on board uh, and then go to the client and explain the situation. Because of course, the client's a decision maker, but if the solicitor's backing you, that makes your life just practically much, much, much easier. Um, so I think all of those sorts of things we'll be looking for, for for an even better answer. I don't know if Daniel or Anarkley, either of you had, a, had any thoughts? Um, I suppose what I would say was that um, I think, you know, the first port of call would be your supervisors, particularly if it was in your first, in your second six. You, I, we would expect you to call your supervisors in addition to the people that Alex has mentioned. And we would also expect you, you know, Chambers is a resource for you to fall back on. Um, and we'd want you to use it. But secondly, um, in terms of uh, the practically managing this, you would always want, you know, you'd have to explain to your instructing solicitor that you are in potentially in the position of being professionally embarrassed. And normally that's enough to put the wind up your solicitor because what they don't want is an ineffective hearing and they don't want your client not to have counsel given that they probably paid, you know, quite a lot for you to be there. So the first, you know, I, it, this would be like, the best quality answer ever and we wouldn't necessarily expect you to know this but you we would want you to we you know practically speaking you would be speaking to your instructing solicitor and saying that I'm potentially in real difficulties here and unless this information is um, disclosed because my view plainly is that it's relevant I may well have to withdraw and see what they say and then present it to the client in that way. And I, I just wanted to pick up on something I said earlier about the ethical questions which um, is how we approach them if you have less knowledge about um, the ethics of the situation. I really just want to say two things. The, the first is that we do expect you to um, have familiarised yourself to a certain extent with the ethical code. It's available online. You don't need to have had lessons on it. Um, but if you're in the position where you don't know it back to front because you haven't actually studied it formally, then, then really what, what we're looking for is your thought process. Um, and, and you'd find that you're given some nudges along the way, given bits of information along the way, and we'd look to see how you use that to develop your answer. D Daniel, having having watched it back, apart from the, the lovely backdrop and the, the turtle neck, um, mm -hmm. what were your other thoughts on it? I think in addition to the comments that you've made on content, I do think it could have been more clearly signposted at the start. So a little point on structure. I think you could have set out at the start that because you consider the information to be relevant, the following three perhaps core duties will be engaged. You could then set out in turn what each of those core duties are without needing, needing to name the particular number. And then I think you'd want to say that of these core duties that are engaged, the following two would be in, in clear conflict in the present scenario. And I think from that basis, you could then begin to set out how you'd approach the question. So perhaps more, more clear, clear signposting at the start, I would say. Brilliant, thank you. Over to you, Narkali. Great. Well, thank you very much um, to Alex, Swishti and Daniel for that, because it will have taken them quite a bit of time to record those videos. And I may say, I hope you will agree that they were an absolute corker to watch. So <laughs> um, let's go on to the bit where Sam comes into his own, uh, along with Daniel. And what they're going to do is really help give you an idea of how best to prep for interviews you know, um, how to practice, um, where to access resources, and also the sorts of things they bore in mind when they were going through the interview process themselves, what it was that they thought that we were looking for and how they managed to attune their answers to those things. So over to you now, Sam, thank you. Thank you very much, Anarkali. 
Um, so I'm going to assume that before any of your interviews, you'll all have thought to read through your applications and everything else like that. But as you will have seen, you are going to be asked questions that go quite a way beyond that. Um, it's much more about how you answer those questions when you're on the spot, as it is your knowledge of the subject matter. And as you will have seen from the earlier examples, they aren't straightforward. They will likely engage a variety of competing propositions. A good and convincing answer will identify those propositions, will explore the tension between them, giving credit to the counter arguments and explaining why, on balance, you are answering as you have done. Uh, this is very much a learned skill. And the more you do it, the better you will get at identifying those propositions, those different and competing factors, weighing them up and presenting them in a compelling way. So I remember getting my invitation to interview um, and thinking when I'm on the other side of the table, how on earth do I prepare to show these skills to a panel of people who are listening to every word I say? It's obviously very nerve wracking, but how do I best deal with that? First and foremost, for those of you who have already joined an inn of court, it's worth checking what schemes or resources they might have available, and they will have something available, I'm sure of it. All of the education and training departments offer some form of mentoring scheme with barrister members of the inn, and they're often very, very helpful. As your mentor, they might be willing, depending on how well you get along with them and their available commitments to offer you some interview practice. And this is really important because they've been through it. Likewise, I know that the inns will also offer mock pupillage interview schemes. Um, these are the same idea, uh, but a slightly different format. You will need to apply for both of these, and sometimes there are limited spaces. So it is important to be proactive. And if necessary, just think about sending an email to the education and training department. Another very good starting point, uh, which I and a fair few of my friends did at bar school, is to try and get together a list of some example questions. Uh, I know that at the moment, in a temple has got a list on their website. And although this is quite basic, it should give you a starting point and possibly some, some inspiration. Uh, what we had at bar school was a, a Google Drive document. Uh, that we could all add questions to if we'd been asked them before, if we'd seen them on a Twitter thread about some sort of horror story or, or something that we just thought would be challenging to ask each other. Um, for example, one of us might have seen an article in the newspaper or watched something on the news uh, about the backlog of cases due to COVID-19 and the effect on the criminal courts and thought that's pretty topical. That's going to affect the working life of the barrister. Uh, I wonder what I might be asked about this. And this brings me to an important point. The best way to get used to dealing with these things, to weighing up these competing pro propositions, is to get used to actually answering the questions. If you can find some other people who feel the same, who are going through the same process, it's best to sit down and take turns asking each other questions and offering each other feedback. This can be a friend, this can be a family member, it can be people in your seminar group or just someone you've met, a, 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 say, on the GDL who also wants to be a barrister. This will do several really important things. First, it will hopefully help you feel a little bit more comfortable when you're in that situation. Second, it will help you learn from other people and seeing how they approach the same question, difficult, uh, same question differently how they break it down, how they present it, and the different competing factors that they might focus on, but you might have missed. And third, one of the things that's extremely helpful is, is to think about what feedback you'd be giving each other. Um, it encourages you to be critical in a way uh, that is very, very constructive and think about how a good answer will hang together. Now, another way of doing that, uh, which was actually recommended to me uh, on pupillage, uh, when looking about how you're going to make submissions or anything like that, is to consider recording your answers and to watch them back and think about how you came across. Would you want to listen to it? Would you uh, be satisfied with that answer? What questions do you felt you left open or didn't address? Think about it, you can write it down, and then you can try it again. 
the important thing is not necessarily your answer to the question, but what your answer is actually demonstrating and how you understand what it is you are being asked uh, and how to properly break it down. Uh, I think that's the most important skill, but I'm conscious that Daniel, you went through it a lot more recently than me. I, I don't know if you've got anything else to add before, of course, we give everyone else the chance to uh, put us in, in the hot seat and to ask us the questions. Thanks, Sam. Uh, yeah, just to build on what you said, I also created a bank of questions and I do think it, it's something that everyone should do. And in terms of, of where to get possible questions from, I, I agree, I, I heard about the Inner Temple list and, and that's useful. I also think reading relevant family law cases, um, very recent cases. So if you go on Bailey, you can access the most recently published judgments. And I think if you have time just to familiarize yourself with recent judgments and recent issues, that will no doubt um, bode well and prepare you well. You can also access articles on Family Law Week. So this might also get, get you a good sense of, of, of what are the current issues that are being discussed at the moment. I know some of Family Law Week is through a paywall, but a lot of the articles are also free for all to see. To, to, reiterate, to reiterate what you said about practicing, practice those questions, practice them with family and friends, but also just practice them with a wall. I certainly did a lot of that, particularly because I was preparing during lockdown. So my, my wall and my mirror really did get a lot of, of practice from me. Um, but it isn't, it's a learning process. It truly is. And I think if you simply practice out loud, um, the repetition and the practice will help with that learning process. I think, I think that's what I'd add at the moment. Right, that's and I, I just want to be really boring and, and re-emphasize that, which is that when I did my pupillage interviews, I definitely thought that if you read a bit around the topic and polished your shoes uh, and tried your best on the day, that, that it would all go okay. Whereas actually interviewing is a, is a learned skill. It, it's not about just being a great person and showing it. It's, it's a learned skill like anything else. Um, and practice is just absolutely fundamental. And, and actually, I think pe people often say, I don't know if this is true, but people often say that Americans are much better at being interviewed um, than people who've gone through the UK education system. And I think there's, there's not really much an emphasis at school, certainly at my school, um, in respect of developing the skills that you then need for interview. And, and equally, I wouldn't say I did much at university about that. So you do, you do need to do all of the things Sam has suggested to access some help some resources um to practice and and even if you end up like daniel doing it to the wall and doing it to the mirror but just get doing it somehow thank you so much um i think really from what i would really like you to take away from this is the sense that what we're looking from you for sorry what we're looking from for what we're looking for from you is really how you're thinking through these questions we want to understand how you develop an argument. That's really one of the most fundamental things that we really want to see you able to do. And identifying the core components of, a, of an argument and being able to express them is a skill that you can learn. You may not be very good at it to begin with, but if you keep practicing, as everybody said, you will actually be much, much better than when you first started. And it really shows, I mean, it's really easy, I guess, for me to say um, this is what you need to do. But what you've got to understand is that I'm so much more confident because I've spent 15 years arguing things one way or another. And that's 15 years of practice. And it's the same for Alex. It's the same for Sam. It's the difference between Swishti's first answer and her second answer. She, you know, these are all very talented people, but they have practiced. And that's what has really brought out um, you know, the, the kind of the quality uh, that we're looking for. And you can do that as well. It's absolutely free. So I really want to give everybody who feels that they haven't perhaps always had the breaks that other people have had in this process, a hope that is something you can do. You don't need sophisticated resources or an expensive education to do. You can just do this with your friends and family. I cannot emphasize that enough. And I hope also that when you see the way that we mark your answers, we, you will understand how totally um, 
you know, this isn't about whether or not we like you, whether or not we think that you're going to be a great member of Chambers, you know, with, we'll be friends with you or come down to the pub. This is a really objective process from our point of view. And we're really just looking for somebody who can hit the competencies that we've identified in the most, in the kind of the, the best way. Um, Alex, did you want to say something in addition? Yeah, to I just that? I just wanted to say one final thing, which is that um, if you aren't successful in an interview for a particular set of chambers, it, it can feel intensely personal. And it can feel as if there's something wrong with you or you're just no good or that people don't like you. But but it's none of that. It's as anarchically as saying it's it's us doing our best to give each of those answers that you present to us a mark out of five, and then we add them up. Um, so recognize that you can have a good day and a bad day, and that if it goes badly somewhere else, it can still go really well at Quorum. If it goes badly at Quorum, it can go really well somewhere else. Um, and if you've applied to Quorum in previous years and you've got through to interview and then you haven't got through to the second round or you haven't been offered pupillage, th that doesn't matter. Try again, keep on practicing, come again. We'd we'd love to hear from you. Um and yeah, it's just I think really important to remember that a bit of perseverance goes a long way. Thank you very much. Thank you to Narkley, thank you to Ginny, thank you to Srishti, Sam, and uh Daniel. And, and I hope that this has been helpful for people. Um and that if you're watching this the night before your quorum interview, good luck for tomorrow. Thanks, Alex, and goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.